to I welcome Helen. Like, and I had never experienced Guy Fawkes Day before. I asked James one night, what were all the fireworks about going off? It's, they seemed to rattle off for about a week. So now I've experienced my first Guy Fawkes Day as well. Um, I'm honored to be here. I've um, particular, one of my particular motives for accepting the uh, Fulbright uh, appointment at uh, UC Canterbury because, was because uh, James Smithies is here and I have been reading drafts from his uh, Paul Grave uh, Macmillan book. Um, in particular, the chapter on uh, infrastructure interested me. Um, I hope you'll be able to use, uh, in particular, I think you'll probably show a diagram from that chapter later on in my own work. So this was a um, opportunity for elective affinity in this regard, since we're both working on similar kinds of issues. I want to give you today a uh, piece of a book that I've been writing in fits and starts. Um, in fits and starts, because I just don't know enough and um, since we do have IT professionals in the room, that's what's been giving me the fits. I'm serving on uh, university committees uh, in order to get close to the equivalent uh, IT professionals in my orbit at UC Santa Barbara, in order, just, in order just to learn what I need to learn to move the project forward. So the piece that I, the book that I'm gonna give you today um, is primarily uh, academic in orientation and methodological and theoretical. I barely get to the uh, practical uh, IT issues at the very end of the talk um, that this might apply to, so I apologize for that in advance. Much of the book, by the way, is vaporware, so, uh, but it's a good start. I start with a um, epigram. It's from uh, the Finnish architect, Elio Saarinen, uh, the older of the two, uh, who are well known. Always design a thing by considering it in its next larger context. A chair in a room, a room in a house, a house in an environment, an environment in a city plan. Um, what I will be delivering today is the first chapter of the book, uh, which I title a lightly theoretical introduction. And then I'm just going to uh, bullet point a few pieces from later in the book in order to show you where I'm, I'm going. And that's all I'll be able to do today. My aim in this book is to make a strategic intervention in the development of the digital humanities. Following up on an essay that I published in 2012 titled, Where is Cultural Criticism in the Digital Humanities? I call for digital humanities research and development informed by and able to influence the way scholarship, teaching, administration, support services, labor practices, and even development and investment strategies in higher education intersect with society or a significant channel of the intersection between the academy and other social sectors, at once symbolic and instrumental, uh, consists in shared but contested information technology infrastructures. So just parenthetically, um, humanities cyber infrastructures is a subdomain of my topic, which is a larger sphere of academic um, infrastructure. I first lay out in the book a methodological framework for understanding how the digital humanities can develop a mode of, um, I'm going to call it critical infrastructure studies. I then offer a prospectus, at this point vaporware, for the kinds of infrastructure, not just research cyber infrastructures, as they've been called, whose development the digital humanities might help either create or guide. And I close in the book with thoughts on how the digital humanities can contribute to ameliorating the very idea of development technological, socioeconomic, and cultural today. So the introduction of the book begins with a session titled simply Method 1. The first step, framing for the digital humanities a suitable methodological framework for critical infrastructure studies, is challenging given that the digital humanities are maturing after the late 20th century bloom of humanities theory and cultural studies, uh, which grosso modo, I'm gonna amalgamate under the term critique here today. The latecomer status of the digital humanities in this regard is epitomized in the field's debate a few years ago about hack versus yak, if you know that bumper sticker. Should digital humanists primarily program, build, or make hack? Or should they instead critically interpret and theorize information media past and present in a manner much like normative humanities research, yak. At core, the debate is not really about theorized critique versus something other than such critique, I think. 
Instead, the debate situates the digital humanities at a fork between two branches of, I'm going to call them late humanities critique. One, a hack branch, sometimes referred to as critical making, and also sometimes the epistemology of building, is more concretely pragmatic, but affiliates with thing theory, the new materialism, after network theory, assemblage theory, and uh, many similar late post-structuralisms in that camp. The other, a yak branch, descends from the not unrelated critical traditions of Frankfurt School critical theory, deconstruction, Foucauldian archaeology, cultural materialism, post-colonial theory, and gender and race theory, especially since all of those now have been inflected by media studies. In short, the question is not whether the digital humanities should include theorized critique. At some level, and especially in some branches, the field already does, simply by virtue of being a family member of the contemporary humanities. Instead, the question is what sort of critique is uniquely appropriate and purposive for the digital humanities. What critique, in other words, not only allows the field to assist mainstream humanities critique, but could not be conducted except through digital humanities methods that are technologically self-reflexive as part of the very condition and not just facility of critically knowing and acting on culture today. The answer to this question, I suggest, is critique at the level of and articulated through infrastructure. For infrastructure, the social cum technological milieu that at once enables the fulfillment of human experience and enforces constraints on that experience today has much of the same scale, complexity, and general cultural impact as the idea of culture itself. Indeed, it may be that in late modernity, when the bulk of life and work occurs in organizational institutions like ours of one kind or another, the experience of infrastructure at institutional scales undergirded by national or regional infrastructures such as electricity grids and global scale infrastructures such as the internet is operationally the experience of culture. Put another way, the word infrastructure can now give us the same kind of general purchase on social complexity that Stuart Hall, Raymond Williams, and others of that generation sought when they reached out for their all-purpose word, culture. Consider the way dystopian films produced at the onset of the digital information age, such as Blade Runner, an obvious example from 1982, and the Mad Max films, uh, trilogy, I guess it's now a um, fourfold uh, work yeah, beginning in 1979, characterize whole cultures by foregrounding infrastructure. In the former, glistening gnarled cityscapes defined by transportation and media technologies. In the latter, desert landscapes defined by fuel and water supply systems. Those films gave a foretaste of the way late modern infrastructure is increasingly the mise-en-scene of culture. Daily life steeps us in pervasive encounters with transportation, media, information, and other infrastructures that do not just neutrally convey the experience of culture, but are visibly parts of cultural experience. Late modernity is thus car culture, cable TV culture, internet culture, smartphone culture, and any other kind of cool culture, whereas I studied my book, The Laws of Cool, cool is a cultural affect somehow of both smart technologies and the knowledge workers who use them to be, or at least to seem like they are, smart. The consequence of such convergence between infrastructure and culture for critique may be predicted as follows. Especially in the digital humanities, critique must now begin to focus on infrastructure in order to have any hope of creating tomorrow's equivalents of the great cultural critical statements of the past. Tomorrow's E.P. Thompson writing about the making of the working class, C. Wright Mills about white collars, Raymond Williams about culture and society, Michel Foucault about discipline, Judith Butler about gender and performativity, Donna Haraway about cyborgs, or Homi Baba about hybridity among, obviously, a thousand other people who could be mentioned here, will need to include in their critiques attention to infrastructure as that cyborg being who's making, working, disciplining, performance, gender formation, and hybridity are increasingly part of the core identity of our late modern culture. Now, what would the method for such a digital humanities cultural criticism focused on infrastructure actually look like? To give it a colorful name, 
I imagine that an appropriate method must be agile. I borrow this adjective from a contemporary approach to software development, uh, the IT professionals know all about this, that considered technically as rapid, ad hoc, and incremental, and considered socially as iterative, adaptable, and collaborative, epitomized in so-called software development scrums with their rapid burst sprints of collaborative work. Not great systems of software formally molded to near platonic specs by gigantic consortia, in other words, but scrums of rapid release results-oriented and adaptive software issued informally by teams. Since we're in New Zealand, clearly the illustration is the All Blacks. Now, a slight detour here in my talk. I haven't worked this in, but I've got to say that uh, I myself find the uh, high testosterone level of this particular metaphor in the programming communities of the Scrum a little bit uh, too, too intense. Um, I want to work in here a parallel project that I've been uh, researching for years now about the history and uh, ethnography of quilting parties and quilting bees, especially in the U.S., as they, it was formative of U.S. culture in the uh, 18th through 20th centuries to at least the uh, Great Depression in the 20th century. I got interested in that because of the uh, plethora of books that use the metaphor of either the uh, quilt or the crazy quilt or the patchwork or similar such uh, patterns such as the mosaic and kaleidoscope to refer to multicultural um, expressions of culture from the 1980s through the 1990s. I'm developing the backstory of uh, what that's about. And when you think about it, it's fascinating that um, the quilting bee metaphor is actually, I think, a better analogy to a scrum-like uh, program in software development than the rugby met metaphor, partly because uh, the genealogy goes back to the jacquard loom and fabric work. You'll see, of course, the uh, famous uh, punch card uh, system of programming for the jacquard loom that inspired uh, Charles Babbage's analytical um, uh, machine with its uh, punch cards uh, for programming as well. And the association with uh, feminism at that point comes back in because the association between Charles Babbage and uh, Ada Lovelace, whom uh, some refer to as the first programmer. Um, uh, the idea of a software scrum, when you look at the visual iconography um, in, uh, that uh, in, uh, people use to uh, describe what a scrum is, actually produces in one of the main branches of the visual iconography something very much like a patchwork, uh, a patchwork quilt, um, uh, different tasks in different players on a task board like this. Anyway, I'm going down a rabbit hole here, but I'm really fascinated and this is something I want to uh, work up. Less colorfully, the agile style of digital humanities infrastructure critique, I imagine, one that takes advantage of modes of thinking already prevalent in the field, may be called this is not a very good word, but it's what I have, lightly anti-foundationalist. The question that I concoct this phrase to answer is how much anti-foundationalism, or perhaps anti-groundwork, to allude to Marx's uh, book, The Grundrisse of um, uh, toward a, you know, Critique of Political Economy, is actually useful for critical infrastructure studies. Mainstream humanistic critique the hermeneutics of suspicion that Rita Felsky has recently taken to task in her quite interesting critique of critique has often been anti-foundationalist all the way down according to a three-stage logic that might be simplified as follows. In its first logical moment, critique recognizes that the real, true, or lawful groundwork that is the infrastructure for anything, especially the things that matter most to people, such as the allocation of goods, or the assignation of identity is ungrounded. For example, while there are material reasons for resource allocation and the social relations of force needed to do that dirty deed, that is for political economy and society, any particular political economy and society are arbitrary and in the last analysis unjust. Political economy and society are thus not grounds, but to play on the word precisely ground works particular ways of working the ground, Marx called them modes of production, supported by discursive, epistemic, psychic, and cultural institutions for ensuring that the work continues in the absence of rational or moral foundation. In the second logical moment, critique then goes anti-foundationist to the second degree by criticizing its own standing in the political economic system, 
a recursion effect I tested it in now very familiar post-May 1968 worries that critics themselves are complicit in elitism, in bourgeoisie, recuperation, containment, majoritarian identity, not to mention tenure in the United States. <laughs> Finally, in its third logical moment, critique tends to turn its complicity to advantage. For example, by positioning critics as what Foucault called embedded or specific intellectuals, acting on a particular institutional scene to steer social forces. A related, a related idea is to go tactical in the manner theorized by Michel de Certeau, who argued that people immured in any system can appropriate that system's infrastructure through bottom-up agency for deviant purposes. His example, you may know, is jaywalking in an urban planner's beautiful city. Media critics, including new media critics, have generalized de Certeau's notion in the name of what they call tactical media, meaning media whose platforms, channels, interfaces, and representations can be appropriated by users for alternative purposes. In general, the digital humanities tend to do things according to methods that, from that whole trajectory, that threefold trajectory of critique that I've just outlined, simply slice out the latter logical moment, the tactical moment. Such slicing, hacking critique to sever its roots from purist anti-foundationalism, brings digital humanities critique into the orbit of several late or post-critical approaches with a similar style. And I use the word style rather than theory because uh, they're not full-blown theories because they are anti-foundationalist. One approach that James Smithies in uh, the recent article he published in Digital Humanities Quarterly has associated with the digital humanities is what he calls post-foundationalism. Borrowing from the philosopher of science, Dmitry Ginev, Smithies argues that post-foundationalism is, quote, an intellectual position that balances a distrust of grand narrative with an acceptance that methods honed over centuries and supported by independently verified evidence can lead, if not to truth itself, then closer to it than we were before, close quote. Post-foundationalism is thus well matched to the digital humanities, Smithies suggests. We think of the digital humanities as, quote, a process of continuous methodological and theoretical refinement that produces research outputs as snapshots of an ongoing activity rather than the culmination of completed research, close quote. A related idea is that of critical technical practice, which Michael Dieter in Amsterdam, building on Philip Agra's writings on artificial intelligence research, makes a goal of digital humanities. Dieter quotes from Agra, and this is a quote, the word critical here does not call for pessimism and destruction, but rather for an expanded understanding of the conditions and goals of technical work. Instead of seeking foundations, it would embrace the impossibility of foundations, guiding itself by continually unfolding awareness of its own workings as a historically specific practice." Close quote. Other ideas that are lightly foundationalist in this way, though not to my knowledge yet applied to the digital humanities, include Bruno Latour's compositionism, fixed on neither absolute foundations of knowledge nor absolutist refutations of such foundations, but instead on mixed, impure, make-do and can-do, he calls them compositions of multiple positions. And Akbar Abbas and David Theo Goldberg's, they call it poor theory, which uses, quote, tools at hand and limited resources to engage with heterogeneous probings, fragmentary thinking and open-endedness in resistance to totalization, restriction and closure, close quote. All these lightly anti-foundationist approaches are tactical rather than strategically pure because their very potential for critique arises from polluting proximity to and sometimes even partnership with their objects of critique. Unlike distantiated observational critique, that is, tactical critique, as the root of the word tactic might suggest, makes contact. Smithies thus notes post-foundationalism's function as what he calls a bridging concept for the interdependence and entanglement of the digital humanities with post-industrialism. Indeed, I add that all the approaches I've so far mentioned as a light, light foundation for critical infrastructure studies are similarly contaminated by the double principle of efficiency and flexibility, which, as I've articulated in my book, The Laws of Cool, are the double-stroke engine of the post-industrial mode of production. As it were, all the approaches I've mentioned are instances of lean or just-in-time critique, and thus not dissimilar in spirit to the in-house critique that post-industrial corporations at the end of the 20th century 
began to design into their own production lines by famously empowering workers to stop the line ad hoc or thus catastrophically to suggest improvements incrementally when they saw something wrong. Such dirty contact with post-industrialism is both the weakness and strength of lightly anti-foundationist approaches, where weakness means being swallowed up by the system, and strength comes from getting close enough to the system to know the critical points of inflection, difference, and change. If, as Smithy says, the digital humanities are deeply entangled in post-industrialism, in other words, entanglement need not be the same as equivalence. It's also, put another way, engagement. The critical potential of this tendency in the digital humanities to be lightly anti-foundationalist can now be stated. It's precisely the ability to treat infrastructure not as a foundation, a given, but instead as a tactical medium that opens up the possibility of critical infrastructure studies as a mode of cultural studies. And it is such cultural studies that will allow the digital humanities to fulfill what I take to be their final cause critical function at the present time, which is to help adjudicate how academic infrastructure connects higher education to, but also differentiates it from, the workings of other institutions in advanced technological societies. The critical function of the digital humanities going forward, in other words, is to assist in shaping smart, ethical academic infrastructures that not only further normative academic work, research, pedagogy, advising, administration, etc., but also intelligently transfers some, but not all values and practices in both directions between higher education and today's other powerful institutions, including business, law, medicine, government, the media, the creative industries, NGOs, and so on. The second section of this introduction is titled, I don't have better subtitles yet, Method 2. At present, some of the most influential general understandings of infrastructure cited by digital human humanists such as Sheila Anderson and James Smithies, who have been thinking about uh, humanities infrastructure, have been the large technical systems LTS approach, stemming originally from the historian Thomas Hughes' book Networks of Power in 1983, and the information ethnography approach is what I'll call it, stemming from the work of Susan Lee Starr, Jeffrey Bowker, in their circle. Good expositions of both, by the way, are combined in one of the best conceptualizations of infrastructure that I've so far found, a document of 2007 titled Understanding Infrastructure, Dynamics, Tensions, and Design, whose authors include Jeff Bowker. Uh, that's a final report for a um, National Science Foundation workshop on that topic that they ran. Adding to these general approaches to infrastructure, I borrow in this book another portfolio of thought that to my knowledge has not yet been introduced directly to infrastructure studies. It's also a portfolio largely unknown to the digital humanities and for that matter to the humanities as a whole, even though it is broadly compatible with humanities cultural criticism. The portfolio consists of, and this is the uh, title for the movement, the neo-institutionalist approach to organizations in sociology and in organization studies and highly consonant with it, also so-called social constructionist and especially adaptive structuration approaches to organizational infrastructure borrowed from the fields of sociology, information science, and organization theory. Taken together, these approaches explore how organizations are structured as social institutions by so-called carriers of beliefs and practices, that is culture, among which information technology infrastructure is increasingly crucial. These approaches are social science versions of what I've called lightly anti-foundationalist. Scholars in these areas see through the supposed rationality of organizations and their supporting infrastructures to the fact that they are indeed social institutions with all the irrationality that that implies. But they're less interested in exposing the ungrounded nature of organizational institutions and infrastructures as if it were possible for us in some fantasy ever to get outside of them or to do away with them as they are illuminating and pragmatic, pragmatically guiding the agencies and factors involved in the making and remaking of institutions and infrastructures. Such approaches are thus inherently a good match for the epistemology of building, unbuilding, and rebuilding in the digital humanities. More than a good match, 
Neo-institutionalism and the social science of organizational technologies offer exactly, I think, the right tactical opening for digital humanities cultural criticism because they are all about the site on which the already existing critical fervor and energy of the digital humanities is currently pent up. Institutional forms of technologically assisted knowledge work. After all, when you think about it, the digital humanities stand in contrast to new media studies and network critique among cousin fields as the branch of digitally focused humanities work that has been primarily focused on changing research, authorship, dissemination, and teaching inside or across academic institutions and related cultural and heritage institutions, rather than on broader commentary directed externally at society and social justice, which is much more characteristic of the new media studies fields. The digital humanities are all about developing analytical, publishing, curatorial, and hybrid pedagogical tools and practices at scales ranging from standalone projects to federated or regional frameworks, creating new university programs and centers, changing the accepted notion of academic careers, for example, to include out-to-act or alternative academic careers, and ultimately, instilling a new scholarly digital ethos in the academy in the name of collaboration and open access. As a consequence, the existing critical energy of the digital humanities, sometimes quite passionate and even militant, has been primarily devoted to such institutional issues. Breaking down the paywalls of closed publication infrastructures, for example, is the digital humanities version of storming a university administration building in the 1970s. Can neo-institutional and social structuration of technology approaches to understanding the evolving relation between the academic institution and today's more domineering institutions, most notably business and government in partnership, help the digital humanities release its intramural critical energy? Can that release help propel not just change in higher education, but through higher education and the technological infrastructures that mediate its relation to other institutions also extramural changes in the larger society that higher ed contributes to. In short, can the considerable existing intelligence, idealism, and moral force of the digital humanities be redirected from being only an instrument of institution work to becoming through interventions in infrastructure also a way to act on institutions and their wider social impact? But I do not wish to overreach which is also why I think an approach focused on institutions and their infrastructures is particularly appropriate. Ultimately, the digital humanities field must be critical in a way that does not ask it inauthentically to reach beyond its expertise and mandate to bear exaggerated responsibility for larger social phenomena. Acting out through the digital humanities about larger social issues is necessary, but such actions must be complemented by creating infrastructures and practices that make their social impact by being what Susan Lee Starr in another branch of her work famously called boundary objects. In this case, boundary objects situated between the academic institution and other major social institutions. It's in this boundary zone, just as one example, content management system infrastructures whose use by scholars oscillates between corporate managed and open community philosophies that higher education can most pertinently influence and be influenced by other institutions through what I earlier called shared but contested information technology infrastructures. It's in this boundary zone of hybrid, scholarly, pedagogical, and administrative institutional infrastructure that we need the attention of skilled and thoughtful digital humanists, even if the interventions they make are not called anything as ambitious as activism, but instead simply building. So that's the reason my epigram for the book is that quotation from Elio Saarinen. Always design a thing by considering it in its next larger context, a chair in a room, a room in a house, a house in an environment, an environment in a city plan. If, as academics, we're interested in making an intervention in larger society, then working in this intervening boundary plane of the institution, the interface between our academy and other institutions, is the appropriate place to start. What can we do with our infrastructures in a critically and ethically informed way that um, have a bearing on the relationship between those infrastructures and those outside in society at large? 
So I'm going to conclude my talk with just a couple of um, fragments. I'm going to give you a prospectus of the rest of the book, including all the vaporware that's in it. And then I'm just going to give you the first page and some bullet points from uh, the primer on neo-institutionalism just to, to show you where I'm going with that and then I'll stop in a very unsatisfactory way. <laughs> so after the uh, lightly theoretical introduction, part one of the book, I intend to open with an updated version of the ants and grasshopper fable. That's all about today's so-called insect hives of workers. So I've actually written that. There's a whole uh, fantastical uh, allusion to uh, hives and insect hives in uh, science fiction today about how, what knowledge workers look like, which I use to make the argument that modern organizational institutions, hives, not only serve as a proxy for culture at large, but increasingly are that culture. The fable also explains the warning contained in the main title of my book, Against the Cultural Singularity. Neoliberalism today is enacted in part through the aggressive remolding of society's institutions by one or two dominant institutions in their own pattern, especially business corporations. The cultural singularity toward which we are racing is a corporate one. Health, media, publishing, government, and education institutions, etc., that increasingly behave or at least feel they should act as if they are behaving like corporations. But society is stronger and more humane if founded on the coexistence of multiple important institutions, each with its own rationale, values, ethos, and metrics of accountability, or put better than accountability, I think would be the word responsibility. A neo-institutional framework for examining the relation between society's major institutions at the level of infrastructures that connect and separate them is one way to bring those issues into focus. The rest of part one then offers a primer setting up the neo-institutional framework for critical infrastructure studies. Part two, and this is the part that I'm most embarrassed to show here, given the fact that we have at least three bona fide savant IT professionals sitting in the audience, is what I'm grandly calling a blueprint for development, about which at the present time I have not a clue. Um, but I do have some concerns that I am in the process of researching, in part by sitting on university committees, you know, just to learn more from the IT professionals involved. I want to take a guess at institutional and cross-institutional technologies that the digital humanities might help develop or at least help guide in their development as an intervention in infrastructure. So one of my special concerns is to research and think about the relationship between big data digital humanities research infrastructures of the sort instanced in the Hathi Trust Research Portal incorporating, as it does, the earlier CSER, or software environment for the advancement of scholarly research framework, and enterprise technology systems, ETS. What is similar and what is dissimilar about the architecture of those systems, the way they're thought about, the way they're practiced, deployed, and, and used. A second concern is to examine the paradigms of large-scale distributed cross-university and cross-glam gallery, library, archive, museum, digital humanities research or collection frameworks, such as those implemented in Europe, Australia, Canada, Taiwan, United States, and elsewhere, in the relation both to the traditional paradigm of professional associations and the newer paradigm of open source development communities. In each case, what I'm interested in, in is infrastructure in its combined social and technological sense that creates a parallel institutional space intersecting with, but also diverging from a knowledge worker's particular home institution. In other words, I want to think through the way these uh, large distributed federated uh, frameworks are kind of like professional associations and their infrastructure in the past, and kind of like open source development communities now, which take that professionalism and move it on a lateral plane outside any particular institution. A third concern is to consider critically the relation between the development or purchase of core mission academic infrastructure for research, teaching, and curation, and the development or purchase of equally necessary but non-core support infrastructures at the ETS scale, especially as both core and non-core mission infrastructures are now poised, possibly, to enter the age of cloud services. And a fourth concern, one that's special, uh, a special interest of mine, 
is the possibility of developing infrastructure for re-engaging the academy with the public in the spirit of the forhumanities.org initiative that I helped co-found. I have a whole nother lecture on what that might look like, but I won't inflict that on you here. Part three of the book, if I ever get there, is titled, What Development Means. It's intended to conclude the book by reflecting on what the term developing that I've so often used here, almost in a rote fashion, should signify. So that borrowing here from David Berry's work, the computational term extends and does not replace cultural building. So I'm going to close with um, some bullet points, really, just the first page and a brief redaction of the primer on neo-institutionalism, just so you see the flavor of this mode of thought. To create a framework for critical infrastructure studies, I start by inquiring into, into how today's knowledge work institutions know a variant of Mary Douglas's question about how institutions think, if you know that book. That is, how do the knowledge work organizational institutions that emerged in late modernity and post-industrialism in, in post now think so as to validate their sobriquet as enterprises that know? And how do information technology infrastructures shape such knowing? Neo-institutionalism and the structuration theory of organizational technology address such questions. Neo-institutionalism, first of all, this is the influential approach to organizational institutions that arose among sociologists and organization theorists beginning in the early 1980s. Detailed explications of the method and narratives of its development are available in the canonical volume of essays edited about 10 years after the movement started uh, by Walter Powell and Paul DiMaggio, sometimes called the movement's orange Bible after the color of its cover. It's titled The New Institutionalism in Organizational Analysis. Good explications are also available in more recent syntheses or collections such as these. In my redaction, the neo-institutional view of the nature and behavior of organizational institutions may be put in the form of the following sequence of propositions, what I'm, which I'm building from an outsider's point of view in order to kind of explain the movement to humanists who are not in the field. And I'll just read you the uh, topic sentences of uh, these units of discussion. One, organizations have an institutional dimension that is not the same as their organizational structures and processes. That's the fundamental axiom of uh, the institutional approach to organizational studies. Two, the institutional dimension of organizations is non-rational and relational even when or especially when organizations appear to be rational in maximizing resources to reach defined goals. In short, neo-institutionalism's answer to the question, how do institutions think, is basically they don't think. They act like they think. And even more so, and this is the relational part of the argument, they act like they think better than the institution down the road. Three, intra-organizationally institutions are motivated by different combinations of agency dominated by different personnel. In particular, neo-institutionists, in neo that's a mouthful, I tell you. Neo-institutionists speak of three pillars of institutional motivation, regulative, normative, and cultural cognitive, that together, but in different ways, compel people to conform to institutional ways of doing and thinking. Roughly translated, regulative means what someone tells you to do, Normative means what everyone does. And cultural cognitive, uh, let's think of that generally simply as cultural, means what you've internalized so deeply that it's unimaginable to think not to do that. Four, extra-organizationally, institutions are motivated by the collective behaviors and taken for granted thinking of their organizational field or environment. So this is one of the beauties of this approach. They don't look just at organizations, institutions. They look at the collective behaviors, the whole sets of industries that influence each other. Fifth, both intra and extra organizationally, institutionalized, inter I've got to simplify these words. Institutionalization tends to be a convergent process. That's how we get dominant institutions and dominant infrastructures. 
in this regard, this mode of approach uh, is uh, very much like LTS, large technical system theory, which explains historically how you get dominant infrastructures. But six, and this explains my interested, interest in this mode of thinking more than in LTS thinking, in organizations and organizational fields contain dissonances that can also make institutionalization a divergent process. I'm particularly interested in both the empirical and theoretical studies uh, that neo institutionalists have offered to explain the divergence and sometimes clear subversion of dominant institutional models by other kinds of institutions with special application to what I call the hard organizations versus the soft ones. Hard means organizations like businesses that have clear missions and clear metrics, therefore, of accountability. Soft organizations are institutions like ours, which have multiple missions and constituencies, and therefore almost de facto, um, therefore, unclear metrics for what they deliver. Historically, there's been a complex picture of uh, both persuasion of uh, soft organizations to behave like hard ones, but also uh, umpteen ways of subverting that kind of hardness. Um, so it's a fascinating uh, area. I'm not going to go further than this. Um, the next thing that I need to do in that primer is to explain the um, so-called social constructiveness and adaptive social structuration approaches to the infrastructures that these institutions develop. It's a, a mode of approach that is very influenced by Anthony Giddens work. It says in essence that uh, people make infrastructures uh, in all kinds of inventive, contingent and unpredictable ways. Eventually, however, those um, infrastructures uh, become institutionalized, uh, petrify, become reified, cannot be changed easily. Though the potential for such change is always there, a certain critical mass or event happens and enough people begin to tamper with or adapt the way that, for example, a content management system or a learning environment is being used and we see a new paradigm change, a new evolution of the infrastructure. The gist of this approach, in other words, is to see a two-fold, two-phase kind of an evolutionary cycle between the development of dominant infrastructures and the change of those infrastructures into other ones. You need both that dominance and that notion of change to hold forth a hopeful sense of what critical infrastructures studies might be. So that's where I am. This is uh, what I'm looking at when I'm sitting on committees, I'm sitting on my university's Information Technology Council, which has the charge of uh, vetting and making recommendations to the deans and administrators for the big ticket items. And uh, this is the one that's sitting in our docket right now. I can't uh, divulge uh, the confidentials of uh, where we're going with the decision, but I can uh, divulge the nature of the decision because it's very, it's very common to uh, many institutions like mine right now. Are we, for reasons of um, um, reliability of email and calendaring systems, going to commit to the next generation cloud service offered by Microsoft 365? Or are we instead, for the same reasons, going to commit to the competitor gigantic cloud ecosystem of Google Apps for education? So I'm sitting there on that committee and I'm thinking to myself, I am uh, actually the sole faculty member and only, you know, actually one or two, but the only one from the humanities uh, there. And the projects that I tend to think about, um, the investment in that is a fraction of one penny to the dollar of the kinds of investments that are going into these. And look at what these ecosystems imply. So you look at Google Ask for Education, we don't have all these turned on and bought into right now, but uh, not just the productivity suites, but if you press on more, uh, you'll see that uh, you know, the classroom environment is in there. What I'm looking at, in other words, is a possibility that for uh, back-end support missions of uh, low-level email and calendaring, we're getting into ecosystems that have long-term implications about core mission infrastructure for learning research and um, data storage, there's going to be the possibility of lock-in in the future simply because we bought into these systems. Why not use the uh, you know, Google Classroom as a learning environment since we're already there with uh, email in calendaring? My statement, the book statement, I hope, is one that will go something like this. Digital humanists, you, 
me, we better begin sitting on those committees and uh, paying some attention and learning a little bit about the gigantic systems of infrastructure that are in the docket right now and being talked about because they have long-term implications within which our concerns, looking at things like the Hathi Trust Research Portal right now, are embedded somehow in ways that we don't fully understand. I want to know what is the relationship between the architectures and ideas in something like this research ecosystem and the larger set of academic research and other in, uh, infrastructures that the universities are involved uh, with. So I'll close there. Okay, Sydney. <laughs> Yeah. And yet it's living in a world of punctuated equilibrium. Yeah. And I think that's actually a dangerous place to be in. Yeah. Because you have very little room to maneuver. So you might think that the you know, the siren and metaphor is enabling, but it can also lock you in to someone else's space time continuum. Yeah, I should really redraw my visualization of that uh, visual epigram in such a way that uh, it's clear that they are not necessarily only containment structures, but they sometimes uh, overlap in non-coincident kinds of ways. I take the point of Sydney's uh, question, which is something like this. Uh, as you may know, if you follow the digital humanities field, there's been quite a bit of controversy about whether it is a field um, or rather a big tent in a big tent that is not uh, um, in the style of a missionary's tent to go back to evangelical kinds of movements, but is truly inclusive rather than you know, ex exclusive. Um, Sydney's uh, point goes something like this, if I may extrapolate a little bit here, it could very well be that uh, digital humanities is on a race toward institutionalization in a way that exactly mirrors uh, the kinds of institutional structures I would like it to think critically about, that might be a translation of Sydney's uh, question uh, here. And um, I don't have here with me um, my other talk, which I've given here, which I start with my uh, visual map of the DH uh, space. Uh, it's one that is uh, multi-dimensional and uh, has many quadrants on it where what we commonly think of as academic scholarly digital humanities is simply one uh, quadrant. I'll draw from that uh, conceptual map, however, this one particular aspect of it, one of the uh, features of that map that is most cardinal, there's a version of it online as, as well, is that digital humanities, as we normally think of it, uh, sits adjacent to, but is not um, in any normative way uh, fully uh, uh, articulated with the cousin field of new media studies. Uh, they have different traditions, uh, different departmental uh, locations on campus, and different foci of interest. So digital humanities uh, commonly sit very close to traditional humanities departments, such as literature, history, classics, and philosophy. They're often very text-oriented, and they're very uh, historically minded as well. So um, historical uh, corpora, for, for example. By contrast, the uh, new media sc scholars are uh, very much oriented toward present media and uh, toward uh, a larger set of media forms. So they tend to ask questions such as, what is the interest of Twitter? Whereas the other community asks, what is the interest of a historical corpus of 19th century novels, um, for example? It's also the case that uh, the new media studies crowd is much more um, activist. Uh, it's not by accident uh, that many more people from the new media studies crowd in the United States go to the um, annual convention of the um, American Studies Association, which is a, a very robust community of people interested in social justice kinds of issues. We don't have those kinds of panels usually in digital humanities conferences. Even though I know so many uh, new media studies people, and some of my own work is in that uh, area, there are actually few institutional structures right now that allow those two communities to um, convene and talk to each other. 
There are almost no conferences, no anthologies, no uh, journals in which those two sets of communities overlap. So my answer to sitting would go something like this. Um, one of the things we can do to safeguard against the digital humanities becoming an enclosed self-institutionalized structure is to uh, really make an effort at some point to um, um, bring our field into co communication with its cousin fields, including among others that might be mentioned new media studies, because that's how you get a collision of different kinds of perspectives and understandings about uh, what digital humanities is and what its infrastructure should, should be. If in the digital humanities, one of the gravitational centers of infrastructure is still the paradigm of the library in one way or another, that's not at all the paradigm of infrastructure in the new media studies crowd. They're all studying a real-time social networking systems and streams and timelines and so on that have very little you know, penetration into the library space. Okay, that's enough on that topic. Um, does that answer the question, or are there other questions at this point? Uh, yes, Dave. I just wanted to say that this is fascinating, a fascinating insight for me as someone who's coming out of a completely sort of technologically focused field to see how these types of issues are treated within your disciplines, or these related disciplines, the family disciplines that you described. And um, uh, I also found fascinating the, the um, use of the rich terminology that you've um, developed as well. And, Borrowing bits from from the technical um, from the technical world, um, I'm actually wondering, based on what you described, if if actually the another synonym for your light anti foundationalism um, could actually just be the hacker culture, yeah, because um, or hack, even hacktivism, which I guess has an activist um, flavor to it, um, just because the the focus of of hacktivism is relentless practicality and, and a continual incremental movement towards um, uh, some, well, either continual movement towards um, pure, a, a particular goal or um, frivolous play with a slight yeah. background motivation to move towards a goal. But the idea is to achieve cross-pollination by reusing re existing skills that, that the individuals involved possess and possibly using the opportunity to explore areas which they have wanted to learn more about. So the act of learning also, um, or the act of learning methodologies allows you to achieve a goal that you... Yeah. yeah. I really like that line of thought. Um, the um, network critique crowd, uh, for example, Herod Lovinx and his uh, you know, colleagues at the University of Amsterdam who have done a lot of work about hacktivism, in its um, more politically active kinds of ways, uh, they draw that uh, mode of activity into the orbit of uh, what, I call, what I called earlier tactical media studies. The use of um, existing machineries and infrastructures and practices uh, against the grain almost to do something else. And that, I think, um, touches on what uh, you're uh, signaling here as a kind of a hacktivist, hacktivist um, you know, um, um, frame of mind. So here's a machine. It's intended to do this for this particular purpose. And I actually want to do something slightly different. So I'm going to go in there and I'm going to take another piece of machinery from an entirely different you know, framework and just kind of plug it in here. Maybe I can get this wire to hook up to this wire. And uh, without any larger systemic um, uniformity to the whole system, make this thing go. Right? That's a kind of a hacking kind, kind of a, a, a activity uh, here. That would be what Bruno Latour, I mentioned this as well, calls uh, compositionism. That is that you take two different kinds of positions or frameworks and just kind of uh, jam them into each other for the purpose of making it, it go. Um, yes, it's a relentless um, practicality that's constrained by um, relatively few, you know, you, you have what you've got and, and you use that, you know, it's the, the yeah. ingenuity that you can achieve with it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what, what, there's one term that you use that Poor something. Poor theory. Poor theory, okay. I'm just wondering if that has a relationship to it, but I guess I'll Poor theory is uh, best analogized to um, what they call sustainable technology. Um, so um, people who talk about sustainable technology and adaptive technology talk about, for example, wind up radios and lights in Africa. Um, so small pieces of standalone technologies that aren't plugged into giant infrastructures because the infrastructure is not dependable in a networked kind, kind of way. So poor theory by analogy are small little modules of uh, working theoretical units that aren't part of some larger <laughs> system, 
or a philosophy or something else. Things you pick up along the way is useful to talk about something. Um, you know, those of us who have been teaching many years, you realize that uh, part of the facility of good teaching after years of experience simply comes from having little modules and examples and paradigms and little tactics that you picked up and evolved over 20 years, or in my case, 30 years of time. And in any one class, it's a kind of a, a talent to just mash them up together. Mash up is another way of talking about hacktivism. Just to mash them up together, right? And uh, they, they, they plug together very well, even though you have no larger, larger uniform theory of, of pedagogy in, in, in the background. So, um, should I sit down now? <laughs>